Now let me welcome today's reader, um, Professor, uh, not Professor, Rabbi Ariel Berger, uh, who is a graduate of um, the Uni Professors Program where he earned his PhD, but he was also an undergraduate at BU. So he's a double BU alum. And I remember Ariel was in one of my earliest classes that I taught at BU, 1994, 1995, or 1996, um, before I became a regular member of the faculty. And Ariel came back from Israel. He had studied in yeshiva, and he needed his transcripts um, uh, acknowledged. And I brought them to the chair at the time. Um, and he said, wait a minute, yeshiva, isn't that high school stuff? And I argued vigorously on your behalf. You didn't know this, but I'm telling you now, many years later. And um, of course, your, your, your transfer credits were approved, I believe. Um, in any case, um, Ariel went on to um, working very, very closely with Professor Wiesel. And many of you, of course, were there at the same time. And you know Ariel, so he's a known quantity and a good friend. And um, it's a great pleasure to have you read for us from your uh, book, Witness, which is about your experience, personal experience, but in relation and, and in conversation with the classroom experience. Here at BU with Professor Eli Wiesel, um, which I have always thought was a very special thing to be you. It's nowhere else that Eli Wiesel was so present in such a, such a special way uh, in a classroom every fall. And that experience has impressed itself on everyone who took a class with him. We had Sonari here two, two weeks ago. He was one of those students. We have Martha Hauptmann online, who was, of course, uh, very, very important in connecting students with Professor Wiesel. And um, it is really a privilege to have the opportunity to, to hear from you and uh, learn a little bit about what it was like in that classroom. And also at the end, we want to hear a little bit of where you are taking this experience uh, with the Witness Institute that you are now have co-created with uh, Elisha Wiesel. So without further ado, it's your turn, Ariel. Wonderful, Michael, thank you. And thank you for advocating on my behalf all those years ago. I, I'd forgotten about that that episode, that chapter of translating a different kind of study into a university setting. That's exactly I, re I remember your class very well, though, on Jewish mysticism. And I remember that you had us do an Abu Lafian meditation, which is a deep Kabbalistic meditation. You had us do an exercise with that to come back to the, the academic study of that tradition, that stream of Kabbalah. And I remember being terrified at the prospect of actually doing a Kabbalistic meditation for which I did not feel remotely prepared internally or spiritually. Me neither, believe me. <laughs> so, so we're living in a time when a lot of the challenges that we're facing and a lot of the uh, conflicts that are taking place in the world right now, um, and a lot of the questions about our future, about our destiny as a species and as uh, various societies dealing with questions of populism and nationalism, and we have an election coming up, and we have oppressed minorities around the world, from the Uyghurs to Myanmar and Syria and so on. A lot of these questions come down to fundamental questions about human behavior, about ethics, morality, and the presence or the absence of compassion and courage in a kind of combination that allows a person of compassion to do the right thing, even when it's difficult, even when there's a risk or a cost. And of course, that kind of uh, value proposition, the idea that we need to cultivate compassion and courage and become ethical people and stand up for what's right was at the center of Professor Wiesel's life and his legacy as a teacher. So I thought I would read, rather than read one part of my book, one longer section of my book, I thought I would read a few short excerpts from throughout the book that stream together, that weave together those, that theme, different aspects of that theme, beginning with the very beginning of the book, um, which begins on a cold December morning in 2005 in Boston, at Boston University. 
Professor Elie Wiesel stands before a classroom full of students. They are local and international students, undergrads, future PhDs, auditing retirees, and professionals pursuing mid-career second degrees. It is the final meeting of Professor Wiesel's weekly course, and students have the floor. In this last class, unlike all the others, they are invited to ask him anything they'd like, even if their questions do not relate directly to the course topic. Tensions in the Middle East have flared again, and students are eager to hear his perspective on prospects for peace. He speaks for half an hour about the political realities, which he connects to the course readings, literature and current events as commentary on one another. When he finishes, Rachel, a doctoral student and a granddaughter of Holocaust survivors, raises her hand and asks a question. Professor, what kept you going after the Holocaust? How did you not give up? Professor Wiesel answers immediately, learning. Before the war, I was studying a page of Talmud and my studies were interrupted. After the war, when I arrived at the orphanage in France, my first request was for that same volume of Talmud so that I could continue my studies from the same page and from the same line, the same spot where I had left off and learning saved me. He goes on. Maybe that is why I believe so deeply in education. If there is a solution to the problems humanity faces, education must play the central role in it. I know that learning saved me, and I believe it can save us all. Rachel and the other students seem satisfied by this response, but I find myself struggling. I am not as hopeful as our professor. Of course, I believe in education but it is hard for me to see it as the solution to the world's problems. Can learning really save us? With the myriad seemingly insurmountable challenges we face today, from global warming to the revival of nationalist and populist movements, from hunger and homelessness to religious hatred and fanaticism, is education really the answer? If you've read my book, or even if you hadn't, you, you probably can guess that the answer is yes. <laughs> education is of course, the answer, but what I needed to explore in writing this book and considering the legacy of, of our teacher, Professor Wiesel, was what kind of education did he mean when he said education can save us? And that's what I'm going to continue to explore in these selected readings. As time went on, and I began to read more of Elie Wiesel's books, I came to learn that my questions about the disconnect between learning and living had a parallel in Wiesel's critique of normative education. He had a passion for learning. It did indeed save him by breaking his isolation after the war and providing meaning, and even more important, the quest for meaning. But the gap between humanity's supposed wisdom and the world he lived in troubled him. Whereas my problem emerged from the modest struggles of a relatively sheltered American Jewish kid, his began as he contemplated the meaning defying experience of the Holocaust. He had many painful questions to ask, but perhaps the one that drove him to become a teacher was this, why didn't learning and knowledge inoculate the German people against hatred? It was after all this most advanced nation on earth, in quotes, cultured and urbane, professing humanistic values that led the efforts to eradicate Wiesel's people. As he later told us in class, one of the darkest days of my life after the war was when I discovered that many of the killers, high-ranking Nazi officials, and frontline murderers alike had advanced university degrees. Many were students and scholars of Goethe and Kant, those great thinkers who explored ethics and morality. We have records of SS officers attending church, playing with their children, treating their pets with great tenderness, then going off to do their terrible work. Doctors were involved in appalling medical experiments, their commitment to do no harm somehow suspended. How is it that the 20th century shows us example after example of the radical separation of ethics from knowledge? What do we do with the fact that it is possible to acquire knowledge and to use it to harm people. 
Professor Wiesel said, I always believed that education was a shield, that to be educated means you cannot do certain things. How come that is not correct? In response to these questions, Professor Wiesel sought to create a new kind of learning. If neither grand literary concepts nor august philosophical traditions could provide protection against fanaticism, if religion too was susceptible to corruption, and how many times in history have congregants inspired by fiery sermons left places of worship to commit atrocities in the name of God, then what could safeguard moral clarity? Learning might have saved Elie Wiesel, but it did not save nations from their madness. There had to be a hidden element, one that could fulfill education's promise to protect against moral and ethical corruption. Professor Wiesel's life as a teacher became a quest for this element that would ensure that knowledge became a blessing and not a curse, that its accumulation would lead to compassionate behavior and not its opposite. Like a scientist, he experimented in his writing, in his meditations, and especially in the classroom, eventually finding and naming this new element. He called it memory. I'm jumping again. Now I'm going to try to, in this, this portion of the book, to dive in a little bit to what this means. What does memory mean? What is the ethical ingredient in education? And I just want to say in a sentence or two, this was my great preoccupation when I was sitting in class with Professor Wiesel. There was so much to take in, so many stories, so many interpretations, great literature, great conversations about current events and the dialogue between literature and current events. But my primary question was about the tools and methods Professor Wiesel used to inspire his students to become more sensitive, more moral, more ethically awake. It is a cliche that ignoring history can lead to its repetition. But we also know that the purely technical transmission of information has never been enough to prevent the next tragedy. If memory is to make a moral difference, we need to locate ourselves within it. In class, Professor Wiesel tells his students another story, one of his favorites from the Hasidic tradition. He smiles as he begins, but the smile fades as the story progresses. Once there was a man who was so forgetful that when he awoke in the morning, he didn't know what to do with the strange objects he found in his room. Every morning saw him painstakingly trying to determine what each item of clothing was for looking them up in research books and finally putting them on correctly. This took him hours and he was always late for work. One day he decided to label everything in his house. He did so. And the next morning when he awoke, he looked around. Following the label's instructions, he got dressed. Quickly, he recognized a chair from its note and sat on it, quickly. He saw the note on his socks and put them on quickly. He made breakfast quickly for the first time in months. Then as he was about to leave his house, his eye fell on the mirror by the front door. He looked in the mirror and froze. Bewildered, he whispered, but who am I? <coughs> it is not enough to know the facts, Professor Wiesel reminds his students. We must take things, history, current events, personally. We must look in mirrors and great literature can act as a mirror. So now I'm jumping a lot to page 190 in the book where, where I have a chapter about Professor Wiesel's teaching beyond words the moments when he communicated without words. And this section is called Language and Its Limits. Professor Wiesel considered memory to be the essential ingredient in educating people toward humanity. His lifelong project was to transmit his experiences and their implications, to bear witness to the Holocaust, and through that, to be a witness for others too. But he also acknowledged the limits of transmitting memories. 
What do you do when you approach those limits? What do you do as a writer and as a teacher when words fail? This was not a theoretical question for him. He was torn between the need to share his Holocaust testimony with the world and the impossibility of doing so. How does one say the unsayable, convey the ineffable? In a classroom lecture, he says, the original version of Night, which I wrote in Yiddish, was almost 900 pages long. And then I cut and removed and pruned. Writing for me is not like painting. It is like sculpture. The painter adds layers of color, layers of paint. The sculptor sees an image within a piece of rock and carves away the material to reveal that image. The words that I removed are still there, he said. And a student asked, how are they there if you've erased them? And Professor Rizal responded, those words are present like the dead are present, though they are gone. And I wrote night in this way so that the silence too would be there within each word. And then the same student asked, why is that important? Because words alone cannot convey the experience. The killers found a language to describe what happened. The victims did not. I did not know, I still don't know, whether I could find the right words. Therefore, there must be silence if one is to have any hope of transmitting something that is beyond words. Look, he continued, language is essential. It is more than a vehicle to transmit ideas or memories. It is a desire of the human being to transcend his or her own limits. Language is composed of words, but it is more than words. It is also the white space between the letters, between words, between people. When you read or better see a performance of Waiting for Godot, you notice that much of the action takes place be between the scenes. The plot is so minimal. The characters are sketched in such a spare way that we cannot help but project our personalities, our wishes onto them. It is a kind of personality test. The characters come in pairs and there is always a space between them. Pay attention to that space. That is where the mystery is. And he goes on, but language can be corrupted. And he discusses this at great length, teaching his students to be sensitive to words like selection or collaborate or purify after the Holocaust to know that those words, fire and hunger and other words have new meaning, dark meaning. And that when we hear those words, we are supposed to tremble. And so we have to be very conscious and sensitive to the limits of language, the ways that language can be corrupted. And this is why, as I continue in this section, Professor Rizal sometimes stopped speaking and started to sing. So I'll, I'll pause here because I'd love to make time for any questions, Michael, that you have or the audience has. That's but the thread here of moving to identify an approach to education that can truly awaken people to greater sensitivity and responsibility to one another is the central challenge, I think, of Professor Rizal's life as a teacher and the central project. And anyone who was there in that classroom, and I know many of you here were, you know that that was his preoccupation always in everything that he was doing, whatever we were studying. And that question, how do you awaken people to that kind of moral sensitivity is so present and urgent right now that that task is not done and he left us a great toolkit, a vast and deep and precise and rigorous toolkit to do that difficult work. As you may recall, uh, President Silver, who brought Elie Wiesel to campus, was at heart not just a Kantian, but he was a Boston personalist, uh, the only philosophical school named for Boston. Um, personalism a la Silver meant that you knew something about the fact that Ariel just illustrated so beautifully that there is a kind of education that is conveyed not through books, 
not even through works, but through personalities, in their speech, in their pauses, in their life experience that finds expression in the way they teach and what they teach. And BU used to be a place where John Silver managed to assemble extraordinary individuals, and Elie Wiesel was certainly one of them. And um, I, what strikes me also, and, and we can take that into the, the, our conversation with Ariel, um, once your teachers pass away, you as a student have the obligation to carry this further. And their words and their gestures and the memory you carry of all of that is alive in you in a way in which not even the best book can convey. And Ariel's book is, goes a long way. If you read it, if you haven't read it, it goes a long way to bringing alive some of these memories. But it's 10 times more alive when you speak these words as you just did. And it's so precious for us to hear this and to be allowed into this into this moment of you conjuring the memory of Elie Wiesel. And if we didn't know Elie Wiesel, we would be impressed. But if we actually knew Elie Wiesel, and I know many of you do and did, you recognize how true it is what Ariel is teaching us. So this is, this is extremely uh, touching to me to hear you read these things because they're true and they're profound. And they have to do with learning being more than book learning. And by the way, there's another place where this memory is alive. And Stephen Esposito, I think, is with us. Uh, Stephen Esposito runs the humanities section of the core curriculum at Boston University. And, and he makes a point of inviting you, Ariel, every-, every Tell me how to cook. I've been cooking longer than you. <laughs> Somebody is cooking and they should mute themselves, please. Uh, so, so Stephen Esposito, I, I have to, if you don't want to speak, that's fine. But um, I just want to point out that Ariel has been teaching in the core where he teaches the Bible, but not from a historical critical point of view. He uses Midrash and the approach that Elie Wiesel himself used. And many of the tropes and the metaphors you just used to describe Elie Wiesel's teaching actually have a direct antecedent and a root in biblical literature itself. Michael, you're, you're pointing to something very important. There's a thread here that is emerging, I think, spontaneously. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad to see Professor Steven Esposito, a dear friend and teacher. And the, the thread is, the relationship between what's written on the page and the oral traditions that we carry. And that is what Midrash is about, the oral traditions with which we interpret sacred text. And over time, when you spend time with those traditions of interpretation, you start to realize that you can do the same thing with other texts and also with life. You can look at life or current events and interpret in a sort of Midrashic lens and a Midrashic way um, using some of those methodologies as Professor Wiesel did, and the limits of my book and any other book. And I'm very deeply aware of that when I was writing the book. How do I capture an experience of sitting in the classroom with Professor Wiesel? Is it really possible? Uh, I feel like I, I, what I've captured is, is an intimation of that experience. People who were there can add to it. And, and that's why this, this process of looking at a great man and, and his teachings is ongoing. And the fact that he left us such a powerful legacy and, and specific tools and methods to use, whether it's uh, in the service of literary analysis or very keen and canny analysis of current events, which is very difficult and very complicated. And there are epistemological challenges with that. How do we know what's really happening even in our own neighborhood, much less on the other side of the world? Um, and that was a question that Professor Wiesel discussed with his students often. How do you learn, discern, clarify what's happening so that you can take a moral position? And very, very in a very difficult way, how do you balance the kind of reflection and humility necessary to do that work, to question yourself, and not to jump to superficial conclusions, but also to act quickly when people are suffering? 
and not to be spending too much time contemplating and asking questions that are abstract when someone needs your help. How do you balance those, those two different modalities that are so much in opposition? And that was something that he did masterfully, responding to current events very quickly and with real ethical and moral clarity while holding a space for that kind of contemplation, that kind of reflection. Both of those things, those, those two do, do not usually come together in our world, right? There are people who move very slowly and enjoy spending time thinking about things forever. And there are others who act and they often act with, with great confidence and sometimes they get it wrong. And so that's one of the key questions in this approach to moral education is holding those two things together. It's something that I'm, I'm working with and working with other people to develop a culture of, of doing both of those things. Professor, you, you are poised to, to share some thoughts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Michael, I'd like to add to something that you said uh, and uh, also what Ariel said. First of all, Ariel does lecture. Michael lectures in the core, uh, often on Genesis, and has been a tremendous um, contributor and friend of the core. And of course, Elie Wiesel, for many, many years, gave our Hebrew Bible lectures in the core. Uh, so there's a long thread there. Michael, when you were talking about what Ariel was saying, I'm thinking to myself, I almost got goosebumps thinking about this, folks. Ariel is talking about memory. And it's a tricky thing to talk about how, how does memory educate us? How am I going to teach that to the 200 kids in my uh, intro core class? And, it, and I just began to feel it, Michael, as you were making those comments. I was getting goosebumps both while you were speaking and while Ariel was speaking because I felt inspired. Ariel took me back into that classroom that I had been in quite often over the years with Professor Wiesel. And Michael, you brought up the idea of, of uh, the personalist theory of John Silber, and I did not know that. But if you look at Boston University when Wiesel was here, there was Wiesel, there was Aerosmith, there was Ricks, there was Shattuck, there were all kinds of luminaries that has sort of disappeared with, for whatever reasons. But the idea of being inspired, I can remember walking, uh, picking Professor Wiesel up, I believe it was for the last lecture that he was to give to the core curriculum. And it was on an off time uh, because he couldn't have done, he, he had to do it on a Monday rather than a Tuesday. So we walked over to the auditorium and he, he gave his lecture. And after the lecture, I'd say there was 150 kids there. There was a line of kids with, to take a selfies with him. And it was, he was just delighted. That's what he did to, to people. He inspired us. He inspired the adults, he inspired the kids. And I still get texts from, at this, over the course of the year from kids who remember taking a selfie with Professor Wiesel. But the main point I want to get to here is that what Ariel is doing is bringing that memory to life. And what that means is that it inspires. It inspires me to, to be a teacher. In two weeks, I'm going to have those 200 kids in class. And I can bring back, uh, I can remember for Professor Wiesel giving some of those lectures, and that can inspire me. And I can tell them, because many of them have read Night. We always talk about Professor Wiesel, at least I always do, and Michael and Ariel, of course, do when they're lecturing. But it's this idea that, that what does memory mean? One of the things that Ariel does in his book is it brings it back to life. And that's, Michael, this, uh, these weekly readings remind us that, that we do need to be jiggered out of our habitual lives with inspiration by these awesome teachers that, that we've had. So Ariel, I don't know um, how the idea of inspiration fit into Wiesel's, you asked the question, 
what does it mean to educate by memory? It's still not clear to me, but I know that what I just felt when, er when Michael was reacting to what you were saying was that I was getting goosebumps. And I was like, what's that about? And it felt, Martha, I see you out there. I can imagine you having been with Wiesel for 30 years, working closely with them. These kinds of things, stories that Ariel is telling, just bring back memories. And those memories inspire us to be our better selves. Uh, I've spoken too much already, but anyway, I wanted to throw that out. <clears throat> well, I, I, I want to, in response to that, I'll read something very short, and I think we're we're almost at time. But this is exactly what you're speaking to, Steve. And and I just want to acknowledge there are several of you here who were in Professor Rizal's <laughs> class, and Martha Houtman is here, who not only assisted Professor Rizal for so many years, but curated the class and chose the students who were going to be in the class and created an experience as Martha told me, that he would enjoy, first of all. And second, that's, that there would be a certain kind of diversity and equality of intelligence and sophistication and depth of questioning such that students would learn a lot from one another. So Martha was a key uh, player and creator of that experience together with Professor Wiesel. And, and that raises questions as well about how do you create, how do you curate environment in which this kind of transformation can happen. It's not easy. It doesn't happen automatically. It requires real design and real thoughtfulness. I just want to read this, this short paragraph from the first chapter about memory. In order to transform, moral education must entail more than a transactional exchange of information. It is not only the content of what is taught, the history, the data, but the context that defines impact. It is the emotional relationship between student, teacher, and subject. It is the implicit why at the heart of learning. People are morally ignited less by the cognitive processing of information than by visceral experience, less by the intellect than by the nervous system. Moments of goose flesh, chills up the spine, the welling up of tears. This is why moral education struggles to find a home in typical university settings and even in many religious communities. Yet this is the only way a student can become a witness. That's great. Perfect. I, I know we are out of time, but can you say a few words about the Witness Institute that you are founding? Yes, so, so as I said, Professor Wiesel left us tremendous, powerful tools for doing the kind of work that we need right now in the world. This work of moral activation, of reflection, of going deeper in our approach to current events and current questions, expanding our capacity for a deep sense of responsibility for others, and a kind of level of precision and sophistication in our analysis of the problems that we are trying to address. And because he left us those tools, and many of us had the experience of learning with him, uh, we, many of us feel a sense of great responsibility to pass forward or pay forward what we received from him. And I certainly feel that very deeply. Um, so I wrote this book to capture the experience as much as I could of Professor Wiesel's classroom and to tease out some of the, the principles that we might use in different settings for that kind of moral activation to support people to become more compassionate and courageous and to feel equipped and supported to do the right thing as leaders in their communities and in their fields. And in 2008, some of you may recall, there was a conference in honor of Professor Wiesel's 80th birthday and, um, at BU. And uh, at that conference, I gave a paper about his approach to teaching and learning. And I used a rhetorical question in framing the paper. The rhetorical question was, were we to create an institute to train teachers and leaders in Elie Wiesel's approach to moral uh, empowerment, what would its constituent principles be? That was the frame of the paper. And I saw Professor Wiesel a few days after that conference, and he said, it's a good idea. And I said, what's a good idea? And he said, creating an institute is a good idea. We should talk about it. So we started to talk about it. And we started to develop the idea many years ago now of taking his 
his teachings and translating them into an approach, a framework, a curriculum for leadership training and development. And that's what we're doing now. That's what the Witness Institute is. It's built on the idea that this kind of powerful experience of memory is both possible and probable under certain circumstances if we design for it. And so Alicia and I, together with others, a, a group of advisors, scholars, activists have come together to explore what that can look like. And we've started to test some of the material and develop a structure for training uh, leaders, training fellows, emerging leaders, um, starting in January in a, a year and a half long program course of study based on Professor Wiesel's teachings. So we will study his writings, we will watch videos of his lectures and so on. We will learn some of his songs. We will explore what his teachings mean for us in the work that we do in the world, whether we're tackling hunger and homelessness or international human rights issues or environmental justice and ethics. Um, and in, in that way, we hope to not only continue his legacy, but advance it in ways that will touch many, many people across the globe with a Wieselian approach to moral work and moral leadership. That's fantastic. I'm so glad we heard about this and we wish this institute all success. And since our time is up, I want to just thank Ariel for taking time to read for us, to educate us, to inspire us, to remind us of what, we, what this is all about. Um, you're an extraordinary teacher and it's a pleasure and a privilege to have you as one of our group here.